Welcome to Beyond the Desk with me, Rachel Farrell. I'm a realtor and a homeschool mom serving Southern Middle Tennessee. My mission is to help people live outside of their mortgages by buying homes they can afford and using the rest of their resources to live the life of their dreams, which leads us here. On this podcast, we're going to deep dive the real estate market for consumers and agents alike. We're going to talk about work-life balance for folks who choose to homeschool their kiddos. And then we're going to spend a lot of time talking about all the ways that we can live a life unbound. I look forward to seeing you here every week. (laughs) Welcome back to Beyond the Desk. Today, we have some really exciting topics. We're going to talk about education, the education system, and I have a fantastic retired teacher with me here who has written a book that we are going to talk about, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Felicia Jackson. I taught at Case Lane Academy in Overall Creek. Um, I, I retired last May because I wanted to finish a book because so many teachers were frustrated. We'll talk a little bit about the book later, but most of my students would either know me as Bye Felicia or Sorry Miss Jackson, and they would sing a song. So anytime anybody, even the teachers, they bumped into me and said, Sorry Miss Jackson. I said, Are you for real? <laughs> I love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So it started out seventh grade. That's when the song came out. Okay. So all my seventh graders sang to me all the time. I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. A little joke. <laughs> it's a good joke. It's a very good joke. So you taught at Case and Lane in Overall Creek. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about why you got into education. When I originally decided to become a teacher, it was like a ministry to me. Okay. I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. I remember I had a professor at MTSU who said, if you're in education to make a difference, you might as well move. I said, no, no, no. You can't say that. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, had stand, I had to stand my ground with him. As he said, because you're not going to make a difference. I said, if I change just one student, yeah, they could become president. You don't know what they could become. So for you to tell me, I'll never make a difference. Oh, I find it so interesting that it, at a, a collegiate level, as they're teaching you how to be a teacher, that they didn't start with the student being your why. I was kind of shocked, too. Yeah, that's, that's wild. Yeah. Funny story. When I went to college, it was to be a special education teacher. And halfway through my first semester, I was talked out of it by a professor. I had taken a class and it was a, um, it was, we had to give a speech, we had to give a presentation and the class average out of 25 points was a 12 and I made a 24 because I'm an expert talker, have been since the day I was born. And (laughs) she said that I needed to be an adult in adult education. So she told me I needed to transfer departments and I just took it as a sign and, and did it. But I think that was in 2009. Um, I think with the economy shift and everything, they were trying to make sure that you were real serious about about wow. teaching before you move forward. But it's an interesting. I'm glad that you persevered because I think you've you've made an impact on a lot of people. I agree. Awesome. I've enjoyed it. So you went to school to you went to school to be a teacher, and you had a teacher. Keep going. What were you what were you saying on that? Oh, I was saying so. I had a teacher that was like, and most of the students there were real young because I was in my 30s when I went back to school, and. Um, I was concerned, like, you're telling these young students they're not going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So we kind of went tit for tat for a little while, but then he gave in. I love that. (laughs) I love that, right? You went back and you were like, so your education you have, uh, tell me about your degrees. So I got my my, um, bachelor's degree from MTSU. Okay. And then I went back and got an educational leadership degree from David Lipscomb University. Very nice. I love that. What was your favorite part about your master's? I don't know if it was my favorite, but, and this is not the negative for people who get an educational leadership degree, but I feel like I'm leading in a different way, like through my book and things like that. But I realized I didn't want to be an administrator. Oh, gotcha. Because <laughs> that's part of the administrative degree. Absolutely. I thought I could make a bigger difference in the classroom than I could in the whole school. I love that. Awesome. Okay, so you're fresh out of school and you have your first year, your first year teaching. Tell me a little bit about your, your early experiences as an educator. Okay, so I started out in seventh grade. I was a seventh grade science teacher. Mm-hmm. Loved it. Great. Um, of course, I love science. But I remember some of my students telling me after, and I talk about this a lot in the book, building relationships, that's key mm-hmm. to when you're a teacher. Uh, so I spent time building relationships. Even though I went in, went in the middle of the year, we spent the first two weeks just getting to know each other and building relationships, and the kids were like, this is, this is different. Mm-hmm. And I decorated the room, how these posters and stuff, because there was nothing on the walls. And they were saying, this is so nice. It's just so comfortable to come to class. But later they told me 
because I would go outside for recess. I played basketball. So the boys would knock me on the ground. I mean, I was like a big kid, so I, was, I would chase them around. We would have a good time. And um, but I remember some of the students telling me after we didn't know how to think about you when you first came because we we're like, is she going to be me? Because I was trying to make my I had a seventh grade at the time. Okay. So I knew how seventh graders were. So I thought, boy, you're going to have to make yourself look. My hair was long. So I bunned it under, and I wore my glasses down on my nose trying to make myself look older. Uh-huh. Because <laughs> I thought, okay, I got to I gotta make sure they don't try to run over me. Right. But, and yeah. then they actually literally ran over you on the playground. Yeah, That's literally. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I remember... I remember the start of the year always being like the rules you have. Here's all the rules of the classroom. And then as the year went on, the rules got more lax. You know, once I guess the the teacher relationship, they kind of figured out like, all right, this is how they're going to respond to this. And this is how they're going to do that. But I don't know. I don't know that I've ever had uh, at the very start of the year have like really intense like teacher student relationship building. Yeah. And I only have one rule. That's been my whole my whole uh, career, mm -hmm. respect. That's the only rule I have. Oh, I love that. Because it carries into everything. So I said, so, I mean, we'll talk about, like, if I say, my only rule is respect. And, of course, I turn into Aretha Franklin and sing R E S P E C T. I was waiting. I was trying yeah. not so to I do have that. To sing, <laughs> I have to sing my R E S P E C T and get them laughing and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then they start realizing everything's connected to respect. Mm -hmm. You know, so I tell them, I said, so if you don't do your work, how, who are you disrespecting? And they start thinking about this. Well, I'm disrespecting myself because I'm not trying to learn. Mm. I'm disrespecting you because I'm not trying to do what you're asking me to do. Right. So I love that. That's my only rule. So they I will always tear the books up. You're respect respecting property. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love Responsible. it. Everything falls into respect. So it does. I didn't have to go over a lot of rules. <laughs> That's great. I, so I just it got one. I just got one. Very easy. I just have one. What is it that they say at the comedy shows? You have one rule. There are no rules. And then they just have a, a blast. That's probably not a good idea in a seventh grade classroom, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the differences between uh, education, the education system itself from when you first started teaching and at the point that you retired. Okay. So when I first began teaching, it was, it was more... I could focus more on, um, I guess I should say I had more freedom. Mm -hmm. So I could focus more on creativity and imagination, um, just getting the kids to love learning. And I remember my mom telling me as it got harder later, mm -hmm. she said, but you always worked all the time. I said, no, but I did it because I wanted to. There's yeah. a difference. So I would stay after school and do science experiments and find ways to connect. But it's things I enjoy doing. Right. As, as the time went by, it became more of you're required to do this. Yes. So there was no there was no freedom to do it. Mm -hmm. or everybody's got to be on the same page. We're going to do it all the same way. So that's when I started kind of reaching burnout. Okay, burnout kind of started happening because it's like, okay, this isn't fun anymore. Because I was still trying to make it fun, mm -hmm. but my freedom was being taken away gotcha. to keep it fun. Tell me a little bit more about why... You know, from a parent's perspective, you know, we see things that are happening in the school system. We're seeing things like the third grade retention policy with the reading, the reading standards and um, some of the challenges that that brings um, inside of our homes. But as a teacher, you know, why is it that that you're getting the uh, the call to all be the same why is it that you're you're having to teach the same curriculum like what what is it that took away sort of that freedom to and that's a question I even asked myself because I didn't understand it um I, th I think some of the things they were saying well if everybody's on the same page if a kid moved in mm -hmm. everybody be doing the same thing oh. so we'd be like they'd fall behind then we had a, a, a substitute shortage mm -hmm. so then they would take kids from other classes and kind of split them up among the teachers and they said well if everybody's on the same page then oh those kids but the problem is every class is different right so they were trying to push us mm -hmm. or say me they were trying to push me I, I was usually the one that got the behavior kids and the low academic kids because they're like oh but you're so good with them but then when it came to test scores and stuff none of that mattered mm -hmm. so I've always taught to where my kids are right and then bring them up from there but the pressure has become Everybody's on the same page, and everybody's not on the same page. Right. So that's, that's become a challenge. My last year was when they made that third grade retention thing a law. Yeah. There were a lot of really frustrated parents trying to figure out how to bring very, very bright students up to the standard um, and then also try and comfort 
very bright students to tell them the test score does not define who you are as a person. Like you, exactly. you are still bright. You are still somebody who obviously has an eagerness and a love for learning. And this should not keep you from, from doing that um, as you move forward through, through the next series of grades. Um, but think about how those kids who weren't as bright felt right. having that pressure. Yes, to have Which to was a lot of my students. Yeah. Over and over again to have to have tutoring and then to potentially not be able to move forward, you know, after fourth grade, I think is just mm-hmm. that's a lot of pressure on a nine year old. Yeah. And then then looking at I just think about different students in my class. Like I had one little girl that was crying when she found out because she only got to see her dad once a year. That was mm-hmm. the summer. And he was in Wisconsin. And she would cry every day and she says, But Miss Jackson, if I don't oh. pass, I won't get to see my dad. I mean, she could not focus. Because she was so worried she wouldn't get to go spend the summer with her dad. Yes. I mean, and other students, I mean, some of the stories they would say, I mean, it just broke my heart. Yeah. I said, you know, we're just going to do our best and not, and I still try to make it fun. I didn't want to put the pressure, right? the pressure. But then I would see other teachers, they would be breaking down crime because they were afraid the kids weren't going to, because there were about the evaluation mm-hmm. and how's that going to impact me right. as a teacher if they don't do well, whereas my thing was, I kind of got to, I didn't care how it impacted me. Yeah. I just wanted my kids to enjoy learning and have a good time. How do you feel the evaluation process has changed over the years for educators? I think it's more pressure because we have a rubric we go by. Um, and it's almost impossible. I find more teachers strictly sticking to that rubric. Like they're looking at, okay, I've got, it's almost like you're a robot. Mm. We got to teach this. We got to teach this. But I'm like, when you come in my room, you get what you, you get me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If I, if I get a five, I get a five. But I, I don't focus on um, the rubric and me trying to meet what they want me to meet. Mm-hmm. But I know most teachers don't think like that because I'm more focused on, hey, guys, we're just going to have a good time and we're going to. Yes. We're I think as a perfectionist, I, I would say I'm a perfectionist. There's a lot of plates that end up falling just because I have a lot of plates and I have to kind of say, oh, well, it's fallen. I guess we're going to be fine and move forward. Um, but I do also know that like if I'm given a rubric or something like that, it would take a lot for me to fight the urge to have 110% on the rubric. And I would still feel the pressure. How is it that you were able to overcome the need to be the five out of five or be the 110%. Because I'm, I'm a perfectionist too. So mm-hmm. in the beginning, it was a bigger challenge because I wanted to be like, oh, I want to be a five. But then as time came, like I, I remember I, a, couple, a few years, you get those authoritative administrators because they have a rubric they go by also. But it's like they, it, they would purposely mark you down. Mm-hmm. So that, then I kind of got the attitude like, you know what? I don't even care what my scores are. Yeah. I, I had one administrator and she marked every second. She says, oh, the kids were asking wonderful questions, but you spent 10 seconds answering this one, <gasps> five seconds answering. That's when I shut down, and I thought, you know what? This isn't about teaching anymore. I'm not, I'm not doing this. See, that, to me, again, as a parent, is so frustrating. I remember feeling pressure as a child to take the TCAPs. Mm-hmm. I don't remember my entire education depending on it. I don't remember teachers making me feel like their, you know, job security is resting on my shoulders because right. bless their hearts if they were. Um, but I say, I say all of that to say, um, I, I totally lost my train of thought. I'm going to let you continue on what you were saying. <laughs> so we lose that train of thought Here together. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We can, move, we can move on from that if that's helpful. I think, um, oh, we were talking about rubrics and about uh, about administration and just being, okay. a, being a parent and hearing that and knowing like, okay, she took 10 seconds to answer my child's question instead of five. Like, what if he had more? What if he needed more? You know? Yeah. And I mean, that was even told. There are really good questions, but you took five seconds on this one and two seconds on this one. I said it. I wanted to say, did you even hear my lesson? Mm -hmm. The kids were all engaged. They were excited. Yeah, absolutely. So as a parent, you know, I kind of asked the question earlier, but thinking, thinking through that, the, the questions part of it, how can we help our students? You know, fortunately I have had the opportunity and privilege to be able to take my children home and like we're, we're educating from, from home. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be a lot harder than what, 
than what it's turned out to be. Um, as far as the organizing goes, it looks really great this fall. I'll let you know how exactly it goes with a kindergartner and a second grader having to kind of differentiate between the two. But the benefit I see of it is that I can sit and if JD has a question about something, I can spend as long as we need to answer that question. And if for some reason he has not, you know, gained enough confidence in that particular you know, study area, we can review it again the next day. You know, we can kind of take the pacing on its own. He might be really ahead in math, but behind in reading, and that's okay because we're we're working on this together. But in the school system, we have to, you have to keep up. You have to, you know, as you're progressing through the grades, if you do not understand, then you're still moving to fourth grade. And if you're moving on to fourth grade and you don't understand third grade science concepts, then how do we how do we keep continuing and building on that education? Yeah. I mean, and that that's a that's a pressure, though I never fell under it. Mm -hmm. But that's a pressure. Like when I taught third grade, even when I taught fourth grade, I would do little assessments for my students. I said, okay, they don't know how to do basic subtraction. Okay. But then when I would go to a meeting, I was like, no, you got to teach multiplication. That's fourth grade. You can't go back to su subtraction. I said, well, how are they going to learn how to divide if they can't subtract? So I would kind of go back and forth on it so I would have to close my door and go back and teach them mm. so I mean because there was no way they could be successful if they didn't have that background knowledge absolutely but some people they feel the pressure because we're giving um what do you call it, like a scope and sequence where you have to keep up and give an assessment at this time mm -hmm. and a lot of times I would fall behind because I'm teaching to where my kids are I love so that. yeah so homeschool I can understand because that way you have more more flexibility yes it's been it's been a really great experience. I mean, we went from tears every day and frustration to we're well rested and we take our time and we get to where we need to be. Technically, I don't have to test them. Like they don't have to take the TCAP in order to be able to, because of the umbrella school that we're under, but I've considered doing something like it just to make sure. I don't want them to fall behind. If for some reason they needed to go back to the public school system, I want to make sure that, you know, they would be able to enter well and succeed. Um, but I also, you know, want to make sure there, there are reasons teachers exist and there's reasons why the standards exist. It just feels like there's an overemphasis on the standards and the rubrics. Definitely. They have their place, but they cannot be held as, as you know, the idol. Um, okay, so going back to those students that you were talking about um, that were challenging, your challenge students, mm -hmm. I would love to hear a little bit more about why they were considered challenge students and what you did to help them overcome. Okay, so that there were different ones. Like I had several that were considered challenges, behavior challenges, but then when I would work with them, I was like, they're not a behavior challenge. They just don't understand how to read. Mm -hmm. And so because of the relationships I build with them, they would tell me, I said, so I noticed you were, I used this one, I said, I noticed that you kind of act up when we start reading. And he kind of got teary. He said, Miss Jackson, because I don't want people laughing at me saying I'm dumb because mm -hmm. I'm not a good reader. But he, he wasn't a behavior kid. So I started working with him on his reading. I remember his mom came during um, conferences and she broke to tears. And she's like, Miss Jackson, you just don't understand. Throughout his whole schooling, he's been a behavior problem. He had to sit by the teacher's desk. And now he wouldn't read and said, so now he wants a book every day. So we go out to go get him a toy. He says, no, I want a book. And so she walks in the bedroom and he's under the covers with a flashlight reading. He's supposed to be asleep. I love she that. said, well, I don't want him to get in trouble, but yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of times they, they get labeled behavior and they're not really behavior. Sometimes it's just a relationship. I think I was sharing with you probably one of the biggest ones. Um, he was always kicked out in the hallway mm -hmm. and then they placed him with me. And we had a wonderful we had a wonderful relationship. But then I didn't see him again. Um, I got really fresh. I, I figured it's a God thing, it's a faith thing for me. So I was like, you know, I I don't know if I can do this anymore because they would give me all these extra behavior kids. And I already had a lot in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I get this door, this knock on the door, mm -hmm. and uh, his name is Emmanuel. So Emmanuel biblically means God with us. So I was like, okay, God, you send Emmanuel. So he hugs me, and the first thing out of his mouth was. Miss Jackson, I know I was a behavior kid, but thank you for not giving up on me. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was battling with within because mm -hmm. I knew I was either going to have to move up with my behavior class or get a lot more new behavior. And when he told me that, it just was like, you know, I need to hear that yeah. and not do the behavior. And then the next time, I, that time when he was there, he was telling me that uh, he was a senior at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. He was one of those kids everybody gave up on. But he was a senior at Vanderbilt, 
uh, he said, and because of you, I was always on the honor roll. Because he was one of those kids who was like, never consider, like, you're not going to succeed. Mm-hmm. And then the next time I saw him was after the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl. And he surprised me. So the Super Bowl was Sunday. He shows up in my room that Monday uh-huh. telling me, I just want to let you know we won the Super Bowl. Look where I am and da-da-da-da. So he spent, the, he spent that day with me in the classroom with the kids. I love that. And then the next time he came, after the next Super Bowl, he brought me his jersey. Very fun. Number 43, yeah. He signed about his impact, the impact I made on him. I love and that. And to me, that's what, yeah, that's what it's all about. And I always talk about him, even to my students. Um, that's what it's about. Mm-hmm. It's the impact you make on the students in the long run. Because no, I've never, out of the hundreds of um, messages I get from my students, no one ever talks about the test. Yeah. Miss Jackson, thank you for helping me pass that test. <laughs> I've never gotten that. But it's always about the impact that I made on their life. Yes. I have never once in an interview been asked how well I did on my tests. Even in college, I mean, I went to MTSU, I passed the ACT, but I don't even know that I had an admissions interview. I can't remember what the process was like. They were like, great, this sounds good. You've got the right score. Let's go on in, just the ACT. And then never again was I ever asked. Nobody asked me if I took an AP class or if I was in honors for any of the things. And while all of those efforts, I don't want to, you know, the little students whose passions were, you know, AP U.S. history, um, which was like a (laughs) cult in my school, just FYI. Reasonably so. It was a cult that if I had the intelligence to join it, I would have. At 33 years old, I would be happy to sign up for that one. But at 16, it was just not, that was just not my jam. Um, But nobody's ever asked me that question. Were you in AP classes? Were you in an honors class? I mean, college was really What did you make on your ACT test? What did you make on your TCAP test? Nobody wants to know what I made on my ACT. I don't even remember what I made on my TCAP. The only reason my mom kept my my progress reports was because it says Rachel talks too much on it, and she thought it was funny. (laughs) And one day I would find it funny, and I did, in fact, find it funny. So thanks for for keeping those for me. Um, Okay, so over the years. That's another thing when you talk about it says Rachel talks. I'm, I'm very careful as a teacher. I think teachers don't realize the impact on students. Oh, it hurts. But instead of putting <laughs> yes. Rachel talks too much, I might put um, Rachel's really working on her talking. <laughs> I'm so proud of her. <laughs> she is articulating so would, yeah, a lot would, of things. I would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That, yeah. I think it was. I think it's the wording and how you how you say it. Even when, when I write on the report cards, I would always even if they were my worst behavior, I would say, oh, they're, they made, you always try to focus on the positive. Mm-hmm. They made such great gains in this. We're working on this. Uh-huh. But I never. Opportunities I never for said growth. It, yeah. No, I never said it in a negative way. Much. Definitely was throughout all of my elementary school. Well, really throughout my entire educational career and sometimes even now in adulthood. I will get that feedback. And I it hurts my feelings more than I think I I like people to know because like as an extrovert, I heard somebody explain extrovertedness and introvertedness as an extrovert. You know, we think, we think by our talking, I talk to think. And as I'm sharing information with my husband, as he and I are talking or I am talking to him, usually it's me thinking out loud, going through all of the different possibilities. And he is introverted in the sense that he thinks inside of his head before he talks. Um, And I know that there's, you know, opportunities for me to be able to like, I need to think a little bit before I speak, but it is so innate that speaking is how I learn and grow. And when you have somebody tell you, you know, I bet 10 bucks, you can't be quiet for 10 minutes. Like, I'll prove them wrong. I'll be quiet for 10 minutes, but I'll be crying on the inside and I'm probably not going to talk to you ever again afterwards. It was definitely, it was definitely more, uh, more hurtful than helpful. And I think, you know, just having the right, the right direction. And maybe that was what my professor in college was saying. I see you talking a lot. Maybe you should go to the department that's going to teach you how to professionally talk for the rest of your life. Uh, Mm. And that was something that was helpful. She was very sweet. She wore like a bright yellow jacket. All of her clothes were very teacher-esque. I wish I could remember her name and go give her a hug because I really liked her a lot. Um, Okay, so thinking back through, you know, your years as as a teacher, you know, there was a turning point where you were really enjoying it. You were building the relationships. You were teaching with that freedom that you really enjoyed. And then the rubrics started coming into place. Um, the story of Emmanuel, I felt like was 
you know, according to our conversation before, a turning point for you to say, all right, students like this, this is why, this is why I'm going to keep going forward. Mm -hmm. But could you kind of elaborate a little bit more on, on what it was like to change how you felt as a teacher, regardless of what the system was doing? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot of stuff. I think <laughs> even I write in the book, I had to figure out what was my root cause of the challenges. Mm. Um, and when I figured that out, then I was over to overcome it. But there, there were a couple of times that I did go survival mode. Mm -hmm. But people don't understand, if you get into that survival mode, you can only stay there so long. So I might do it for like a day or two, then come out. But most teachers now, they get in it, and they stay on that survival path until they reach burnout, and they're either ready to quit mm -hmm. or they're having a nervous breakdown. There were so many teachers taking uh, antidepressants just because the stress levels were too much. And I never will forget one time we were all sitting at a table in the, in the lunchroom, and all the teachers were there, and they were talking about the different antidepressants they take. And I'm kind of looking like, okay. And they said, well, Miss Jackson, you're always so happy. What do you take? And I <laughs> said, I drink a glass of Jesus juice every morning before I come to work. <laughs> and some of them took me literally. Okay. And they were like, where do you buy that? Where is <laughs> this Jesus started laughing, juice coming yeah. from? <laughs> I was like, y'all are letting too much. And that's kind of where my, the, the book, mm -hmm. sunflowers are my favorite flower, just a yellow. But one interesting thing about the sunflower is the young sunflowers would always turn their head to the light. Mm -hmm. So I would walk around. I would tell my students, I said, guys, we're sunflowers today. We're just going to turn our head to the light. We're not going to let this stuff stress us out. Mm. So I would just turn my face to the light and say, y'all, this isn't stressing me. I love that. I also love your alliterations. So you have Jesus juice. You have, um, <laughs> what else did you, there were a couple of other like fun things that you did in your classroom. Tell us a little bit more about, about those things. Okay. So like my dress up. Yes. So I had, okay. So I had like different personas. Mm -hmm. Um, and it kept the kids interested, but like to, to alleviate some of the stress for testing, which I almost wore today. So I would wear my dreads and my small mon shirt. And uh, so first we'd get the room all optimistic. We'd get all this stuff up. So when the kids would enter the first day of testing, mm -hmm. I would be Ray Gay J. That's okay. who I was. I had like different names. Uh -huh. So I was Ray Gay J when the kids came to the room. And of course I would talk to me like, hey, mon, what's going on? And things like that. And I said, oh, bless up, which in... Jamaica, that means uh, good luck, uh -huh. wishing you well. So I would say things to them, and they would go in the room, but then I would have, like, scents in the room. Was like, I had, like, uh, Caribbean music would be playing, uh -huh. instrumental, just to kind of relax Elin them when they walk in. Okay. Yeah, so they walk <laughs> in to the music, and then I had, like, fragrances going through, like they were on the ocean, ocean waves in the background. Oh, fine. Just, I mean, just to relax them. So then before they got ready to test, I would... <laughs> I would uh, say, okay, so I'm going to sing before you guys test. So mm -hmm. I would sing uh, some Bob Marley, Three Little Birds, oh. Don't Worry About a Thing. Then when I finish that, Don't Worry, Be Happy. And I would dance around with my microphone and stuff. Mm -hmm. but, but they would always say, that relaxed me so much. Because okay. I used to want them stressed. But I remember one year I did it, and after, between testing, we went outside. And, uh, of course, I'm running around in my reggae outfit. And some of the kids from the other class said, we wish you were in your class. They just looked so depressed. And my kids were having a good time. And I said, well, I'm sure you did. Okay. I said, no, we were so stressed out because it was like, you better do good on this test because that's going to affect my job and Ugh. like bless them. But that's, that's the pressure that public education has caused where the teachers feel that pressure. Like I'm going to lose my job if you guys don't do a good job. I just don't, I don't do that. You just choose not to ascribe to the pressure. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just one of, I turn to the light like a sunflower, but, um, so I'm reggae J, uh, when I'm teaching word problems, I dress hip hop and, um, two-step hip-hop super J. So I teach them how to do the two-step uh -huh. <laughs> before we do the thing. I did um, not ever learn how to do the two-step. I'm really sad I was not in one of your classes. <laughs> yeah, so we do a two-step dance. Um, I'm teaching action verbs, um, action J. So okay. So I have my medallion on with verbs, and I start sing I start rapping. You know, rap is an action verb. Tap is an action verb. An action word is a verb. So when I say I'm about to rap, you say that's a verb. So I would rap the song, and the kids would just be sitting there tapping and clapping. <laughs> so that's after, so fun. yeah, but then afterwards, then they would have to tell me all the action verbs and demonstrate them. So I try to find fun ways to teach them. Sometimes I wear my big afro when I dress seventies, and I'd be um, disco J, and we have like a disco dance thing. I would be, I had like a huge two, uh, tub, probably about three hundred Madagascar cockroaches to help them get past their fear, and that kind of started out a student. A fake ones? No, these are real. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a student had given me one, said, we need a class pet. And so they had brought me one, 
but I didn't know anything about Madagascar cockroaches. And I saw this little white thing oh, sticking no. out the back, and I was like, well, what is that? And um, well, they sprayed my room, and it started kind of bouncing uh-huh. around. So I took it home. My husband doesn't do bugs. I love, I love critters. So I took it home, and I had it sitting in the corner. And I'm still trying to figure out, what is that white thing sticking out the back? So the next morning, I get up, and the white thing's chewed open. And I'm like, it's 3,000 baby Madagascar <laughs> bugs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, my goodness. Is, was that an egg? So I kind of freak out, and I'm looking at it like, oh, no. My husband's going to kill me. Uh-huh. So I start looking around. I see these little, these little gnat-looking things oh crawling goodness. around. They're kind of clear. <laughs> So there's, there's these little gnat looking things. I say, oh, my goodness. And I try to convince myself, okay, it wasn't an egg. But I, then I read to put Vaseline around the top so they couldn't crawl out to get out the top if there were babies. And I had a cotton ball, a cotton ball water with water, so I was going to change it. So I reached in to change it, and all these all these black things grabbed onto my thing. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Oh, no. Yeah, but I told my husband. I went and got some powder and said, I was spraying. Uh-huh. He goes, well, what are you doing? I said, we haven't sprayed in a while. I didn't tell him for like mm. three months. I said, we haven't sprayed in a while, that would so be I me. think that I better do totally it. totally be something I would yeah. do. But then I ended up raising them uh-huh. after that. So And the, kid, the kids loved it. But I would teach. Um, they were in my transformation center, and I would have uh, the transformers up above it. Okay. Because they would change and go through the different changes. But anyway, I would be uh, Agent J from Man in Black, but I was one man in black. So I would slick my hair back nice. and put my shades on. Yeah. I had my agent Jay and I had my cockroach just crawling on me and talk about <laughs> the that sounds so creative. <laughs> yeah. But I had like tons of different characters. We I even would be Farmer Jay when I would read Charlotte's Web. Okay. And I will never forget um when the movie Charlotte's Web came out mm-hmm. and Mr. Beatty, who lives here in Murfreesboro, he brought Wilbur that played Wilbur in the movie. So for my party, we had Wilbur walking around <laughs> walking around the room. And um, that's so fun. Yeah, that's a memory. Yeah, we had a bla- that, yeah, we had we had a blast. They will always have. Yeah, and to me, that's one of the things in education. If the kids aren't having fun, if they're not interesting, if it's not meaningful, they're not really going to retain anything. No. Oh. So my kids always did well. They did okay on the tests because I wasn't teaching to the test. Right. But um, you were teaching a love of learning. Yeah, I love that. The hmm, was I think it was wordly wise. It really was. Is it the one with, with the, the jingles? Vocabulary. This little noun flows around. Surely. Surely, Surely English was that one. Mm-hmm. I remember those, but it was because I loved them. I can't do the preposition one. I can do preposition, preposition, starting with an A, and then that's the end because there's too many. I was like, eh, that's too many. I'm not going to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so I cut it out there. But you turn it into a song, and I will I will most likely remember it. But that sounds like a blast. The many personas of... Yeah, they never knew who I was going to be. Mrs. J. They would ask me, like, who are you going to be today? You have to wait and find out. (laughs) That's so funny. I love it. Okay, so I would love for you to tell the story about why you chose to write the book. Okay, so I chose to write the book. I started for a while ago. Do you mean back to when I originally started or? Oh, yes. Let's start from the beginning because I think the the inspiration, the initial inspiration Okay. It was very interesting. So Yeah, so I was telling you, it was 2009, mm-hmm. and it was Martin Luther King Day. And so at that time, self-publishing wasn't very big. Mm-hmm. So I was researching, what do I need to do to get a publisher to publish an education book? And everything that was in there, I was like, I'm not going to have that. Like one was, a, you need an advanced degree. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I'm not going to have time to get an advanced degree. That's going to take me too long. Then I needed... Um, at least two or three teachers of the year. So I had been teacher of the year once, but I thought you probably won't get another teacher of the year. Then the other one was a writing project. And I was like, you don't have a writing project. So I, I hold my papers up and I'm talking to God. And I said, God, if you give me another teacher of the year or another writing project, I promise you I will write an education book. And I threw my papers in the corner. So the next day when I go to school, my principal says, Miss Jackson, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. So I go in and he says, I'm not supposed to tell you this for another week, but you got teacher of the year. So in a part of me is like, okay, that's just a coincidence. I, uh-huh. got teach- I said, why is he telling me a week in advance? So I'm trying to talk myself out of this is a message from God that I need to finish this book. Mm-hmm. So I go down to my room, and the kids are in special area. And when I get into the classroom, I open my computer, and the subject line pops up, writing project. Uh-huh. But then I just kind of froze. So then I opened it, and it said, someone gave us your name and said you might be interested in a writing project contact us if interested well then I just fell apart Mm -hmm. I was like okay God is like telling me so the writing project thing didn't come through but I said okay you got two teachers of the year within a couple of weeks later 
the superintendent comes in, I get district teacher of the year, which gave me the three. Uh So I was going to, I thought, okay, this is God saying, you've got to write this book. So as time passed, education, a lot of changes were going on. And I would start it, and I was like, no. But I feel like when I got to this point, Mm -hmm. my attitude became like, how can I inspire teachers Mm -hmm. to want to come into this profession? Because it's a profession nobody wants to do it anymore because of the stress levels. So I did it more for, um, it's like God was telling me, you need to do something to inspire, not to complain, not to, um, I guess it's not to complain. So that's really what it was about. It sounds like. Questioning, like, how can I get people, how can I inspire people to want to do this for kids? It's the same way that you were talking about with, like, the report cards. You know, instead of saying Rachel talks too much, it's. Rachel's spent a lot of time learning how to articulate very well, put together sentences. <laughs> how can and I? She will be an awesome speaker one day. She will one day, maybe, exactly. hopefully, be on a podcast. Um, but you know, the same thing you with see, the education you. system. It did <laughs> absolutely. This speaking, it you know, what was a you know a very large weakness in a classroom of twenty three students has eventually grown to become, you know, my greatest strength um, as far as, you know, speaking in education goes. But I think, you know, you kind of, the way you view that and giving constructive criticism to students at the end of each, you know, semester when the report cards come home, it sounds like you're doing the same thing just with your career as a whole. There were some really stinky parts of it, (laughs) but it sounds like all of the opportunities were things that you were able to overcome and that you feel like teachers in the future. And a big big part of that is knowing my mission and purpose. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's what teachers are getting away from now. They don't do that. I remember uh, my administrator one day asked at a faculty meeting, what is your cornerstone? What holds you in place? Mm -hmm. And everybody kind of went around and we were talking. And most people would say, oh, well, my family, that's my cornerstone. Mm -hmm. And then some people would say, well, God's my cornerstone. And they got to me and I said, my cornerstone, I want four, four corners Mm because I want my foundation to be strong. So my cornerstone is who I am, whose I am, what I stand for and what I care about the most. And everybody just kind of froze and looked. I said, because that way if one part vibrates, I've got all the other, I got the other three to kind of hold me solid. That's what's kind of kept me together. I love that. Yes. So I've I've always had four cornerstones. I think that's brilliant. (laughs) I mean, we teach, you know, to veer into the real estate side for just a smidge, uh, you know, the three legged stool, if you're going to have a successful business, then you need to have three, you know, sources of, of leads of income, mm-hmm. um, so that you can have a business that stands firmly on those three legs. But I have never thought to translate that into my purpose. Yep. That's my purpose. I love that. Okay. So the book, you are writing it for teachers. And if, if you had to give, you know, the 30 second elevator speech on, on what the book is about and the one thing that you want teachers to get from it. Okay. What would that be? So let me let me kind of change that a little bit. My primary audience yes. is anyone related to education. I love it. Because usually when you write, they want you to pick a primary audience, mm-hmm. but it's beneficial for anyone. Because I really want parents to read it because yes. there's information in there to help them. Um, legislators, awesome if they would read it so they mm-hmm. can see how it's impacting our students as well as our teachers. So it's really for more than just educators, although I focus on yes. overcoming the challenges of being an educator. Uh, because to overcome those challenges, you have to know what's happening. Because mm-hmm. one thing I noticed with society, the only thing they know about what's happening in schools is that end of the year report card. That's mm-hmm. all they go by. What were the test scores? That's not what's happening behind the scenes in education. So if they read that, they can better understand this is what teachers are dealing with. That's yes. why they're stressed out. This is what's happening to our kids and the stress levels uh, that the kids are going through. I even talk a little bit about how stress and there's plenty of scientific research to back this up, but how it affects kids where they can't remember, they can't think. Mm-hmm. It even changes the structure of their brain. I thought, now you put them through 12 years of this stress yes. and imagine what you've done to their brain, not to mention what you do to their bodies. Because I had kids that had developed stress rash. They had um, gastrointestinal issues. I had some on antidepressants because mm-hmm. the stress levels are so great. Yeah. So, But with the book Overcoming the Challenges, and I kind of tell on the back you just want to read it? Yeah, let me do that. Okay. <laughs> Get my little glasses here. So this is a must read for anyone who aspires to be a teacher who is or has been a teacher 
who's a school administrator, who is a school board member, and or who cares about the future of our nation's children. So it's for anyone that cares. That includes your parents or anybody that cares what's happening to children. Overcoming the challenges of being a teacher will shed light on the challenges that teachers face, provide essential tools to help you overcome rather than merely survive, inspire you to travel the path where you can thrive and spread hope for a better tomorrow and a brighter future. I love it. Oh, that was perfect. Photo op. (laughs) Do it again. Smile. (laughs) There you are. (laughs) I love it. You know, I I think, again, from the parent perspective, we're, we're frustrated and it's so hard to see. I just feel like every vote does count. However, my voice is small, it feels, in the grand scheme of, uh, of education. And for me at the time when I realized just that, when I was telling my second grader, Betty, you're going to have to conform and make your teacher happy and get the scores that you need so that you can make it through this school year. It just did not sit right. Like I couldn't. And when you shared that story with me, I thought that's what's happening to teachers. They're forcing us to conform. Yes. And those of us who don't want to conform. Yes. They put that pressure. How like can you spent five seconds doing this? You spent 10 seconds. I would be mortified <laughs> if somebody told me that. I mean, I remember being in college and a girl counting the number of ums that I had said in a speech and I thought, Mm -hmm. am I good at this? Like, should I be doing this? Because I said, um, 15 times in whatever, you know, sentence that was to be so, so deeply critiqued like that. Um, did you miss everything else inside of my message because um you were counting my, um, no, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as a, uh, there it was, um, (laughs) As a parent looking into it, you know, it is easy to see that, you know, the pressure that my child was feeling was was a trickle effect. You know, we're I'm I'm feeling the pressure through him that his teacher was feeling, that his administrators were giving and also feeling, et cetera, all the way up the line to to Tennessee. What can we do as parents to help um, alleviate the stress on our children, but to also help, you know, make a change in the system? Okay. Well, number one, vote. Mm-hmm. <laughs> vote when opportunity comes. Um, but I would also say with reading, spend time reading with the children. Mm-hmm. Like, um, now I did the um like you. <laughs> it rubbed <laughs> off. Trent's going to start counting <laughs> it rubbed at the off. end of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and let them be kids. That That's the key. And that's one of the things I think is happening in education. I think I'd tell a story about um, one of my, when I was substitute teaching, and there was a five-year-old that had moved uh, from Japan. Mm -hmm. She came in with her name and everything. I remember I saw her again in first grade, and that's what I feel like is happening in public education in the United States. So I see her again in first grade, and I'm like, she's changed her dress and everything, but she's so articulate, Mm -hmm. and she's learned English. And I was like, wow, like within less than a year. And so then the kids are reading, they're learning how to read, and she pulls out this fifth grade book, and she's just reading it word for word and explaining it and stuff. And I, I was just sitting there like in awe. And so I never will forget, I asked her, so what did you do like within seven or eight months that you grew so quickly academically like this? And I never will forget, she, she fell apart. So she had a nervous breakdown. She said, she talked about all the school. And so all I do is I go to school and I, 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 I work and I go to school and I work and I go to school. And then she broke to tears and she said, Miss Jackson, I just want to be a kid. I want to feel the sunshine on my face. I want to mm. get teary. So I want to feel the sunshine on my face. I want to play. And I thought, is that where we're headed with what's happening to education? Where, us in those Asian countries, that stress is traumatic mm-hmm. for them to succeed. And even if you read um, some of the articles and stuff on things they go through, like a lot of them commit suicide. Oh. They pull their, you know, I did one article when I was in college where they were pulling the hair out of their head because they were so stressed, what fearful good that is they that? would not, yeah. Looking globally at what's happening, I'm like, why do we want to put our kids through that? Mm-hmm. To just to be number one. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't understand that. But let the kids be kids. Don't stress them out. Which is why I try to have fun. Mm-hmm. And like, don't say, here, go get a book and go read. Maybe sit down and read with them. Yeah, uh, that would be a plus. I would also have parents, which is a major frustration. The curriculum has changed so much because now you have third graders doing like sixth, seventh grade work. Mm-hmm. It's changed so much. And then you have all, like for math, you have all these different steps that they have them do instead of the way we learned. And I've had, I even had a, a grandparent 
who had his PhD, he worked with mathematics at NASA, mm-hmm. and he goes, what is this math? I can't understand how to teach, how to help my granddaughter with the math. Mm-hmm. But it's like, how do you help them? And then I would hear teachers say, I just rather the parents not even help. And I was like, but then how are you going to, because it's like they're teaching them wrong. And I was like, but how are the parents supposed to help? Yes. Yes. I think I don't, under, I don't understand that. No, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. When he came home, I realized his handwriting was abysmal, like bad, bad. JD mm-hmm. could not write. I love you, son. If you ever hear this in 20 years, it was a fantastic opportunity for growth. But his handwriting was awful. And he was being asked to write five sentences every morning. And I mean, like I watched him write and it looked like he was trudging through just peanut butter, trying to figure out how to get from the beginning of a sentence to the end of the sentence just in writing the letters clearly. Mm -hmm. And when we stopped and actually focused on what the handwriting looked like, then we could start talking about, okay, the beginning of the sentence needs to have a capital letter. You've got to have punctuation at the end. And that is a complete sentence. Now write five sentences. And, you know, over the course of a month, two months, we were able to grow into that. However, if I could turn back time, if I did not have the opportunity to homeschool my children. I would have handwriting books inside of my house. They are not teaching them how to mm-hmm. write properly. And then you go because from, that's not that's not a tested standard. You can't. I don't know how you test that. That's not a tested standard. And I so that's know what I'm that noticing. It's a lot, a lot is, of the thing. Yeah, a lot of the things that well, when I was in school, you kind of got all the basics, but they're taking a lot of the things out because they're not tested standards. Because even when I, my third and fourth graders, I can hardly read their manuscript. Uh-huh. And used to third grade, they would start learning how to do cursive. Mm-hmm. There's no time because you've got to get all these standards in. Yes. So cursive is kind of falling away by the wayside. Right. There's so much benefit to learning how to, you know, I don't want to sound like a old fogey, but there's so much benefit to learning how to write in cursive. So many of these important documents throughout history were written in cursive. If you can't. And your family letters just passed down generations. Absolutely. I don't want yeah. somebody to have to translate those and things And they can't for write me. their signature because mm-hmm. they don't know how to do cursive. All yeah. so important. We're so starting a lot. And then year. also from an academic standpoint, which I don't understand, all handwriting is a major part of literacy and mm-hmm. learning how to read. So I'm like, but if they don't learn that cursive, how do they learn that cognition that helps them read. Yes. If they don't I learn the know. manuscript, how do they learn the cognition? Yes. It helps them read. It's such a creative piece too. While mm-hmm. there is like, you know, very specific rules of cursive, I feel like that kind of writing is an art. Like that's that's the creative outlet that now it's gone. So it stimulates the brain in an art. And I remember in school I always wanted that John Hancock signature. Uh huh. <laughs> Yes. I want to be a John Hancock signature. Absolutely. Yeah. Penmanship was big, but it's like, it's like those basic things. And I know for a while, science and social studies didn't really count Mm -hmm. for your test scores. So that kind of fell by like, well, you can kind of get it in, but don't really focus on it because we're not really being tested. And I'm like, but if they don't get this in science, I mean, it carries over the next year. So if they don't have that background knowledge, that's going to affect them. Or if they don't have the background knowledge in social studies, let's say they get to middle school, but they've never learned anything about anything in social studies, Mm -hmm. how do they, then those teachers are being held accountable just for social studies because they're being departmentalized. Yes. How are those teachers, how's that going to impact the teacher if we haven't taught anything in elementary school to help them with science and social studies? (laughs) Yeah. Yes. So it's like everything's a ripple effect, but no one really wants to. Address it Mm-mm. where it needs to be addressed. Yes, the, they just want to focus on the test scores. The handwriting was huge, and once we once we corrected that, I felt like we were we were kind of moving back into that direction. But I mean, it also took bringing him home for me to realize. And I know that this is probably Captain Obvious, but it is my responsibility whether he's in public school, private school, or homeschooled to educate my child. And I have a fantastic school system that is coming alongside me to support that drive to educate my children if I drop my children off with the expectation that they're going to be the comprehensive you know place for learning for my children I'm going to be disappointed and I it really did take bringing him home and having to actually come up with this is the curriculum for this English language ELA there are so many moving pieces and parts inside of ELA and I'm trying to figure out how to teach him everything he needs to know. I I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge challenge 
to make sure that all of these standards are being met, even within the homeschool setting. Um, but it really gave me a deeper appreciation for what teachers are having to do. They don't get the opportunity to choose their curriculum like I do. Mm -hmm. I get to look at my my five-year-old and say, you know, this is the best math program for you, but we're going to do a different one for your brother because he's you know, different. When I first started teaching, that was one of the things I had more freedom on. Even though we had a curriculum, mm -hmm. I could do what was best for my students. I would always pull from different resources. Oh, I love that. But now it's, I know I, I had uh, lunch with a former student. She's going to be a teacher. And she was telling me about the curriculum she's required to use. Mm -hmm. And she said that the they came in for her observation and said, you got to have more enthusiasm. Said, why don't you try teaching this and have enthusiasm? Because <laughs> she's talking about how the bored the kids are. And I said, mm -hmm. because I had more freedom where I could add stuff to make it more exciting. Mm -hmm. But she says she feels the pressure or she's scared she'll get in trouble if she tries to add something to make it more interesting. Mm, I just thought the scared yeah, you're going to get in trouble. It's yeah, just... fear, which I talk about fear a lot in there. Yes, I love that. That fear, that fear is a big thing. But... um I lost my thought. No, that's okay. <laughs> I just think about your Jesus juice again. I feel like that really has to be what what drives um, getting you out of the fear. I loved how you said the, the, you know, I remember who I am and whose I am. There was a youth minister that I had, the one youth minister that I had for the entirety of uh, high school youth group career, where he would say that he would drop his girls off at school and say, remember who you are and whose you are. Um, whenever they go inside and I just I think that's my biggest aha of this um, of this particular session is I need four I need four cornerstones yep. to build my wife so one uh, yeah the one to help mm -hmm. but it's like what happens if that one gets in trouble yes which is my my thinking so I have four yeah. for my foundation I love that well is there anything else that you would like to share prior to us ending Buy my book when it comes out. Yes. How can they do that? That's a great, where can they find, where can they find but your book? In the beginning, it'll be on Amazon. Perfect. Um, and they keep changing the, rela the release. I was telling, telling Trent that the little things in trying to format it, mm -hmm. they keep pushing my release date up. So today I spent six hours in a chat room with them. Like, okay, I need to know exactly what you need. Yes. So right now it's supposed to be released Sunday, June 23rd. So hopefully, but that's in six everything days. I know that's so exciting. Which is why I'm put. Yes, why I'm pushing. Like I need to know what I need to do. Yes, to make sure it's to all make done. sure it's yeah. So Sunday the twenty twenty third third. If everything goes through, awesome today. on Amazon, mm -hmm. and then whenever we buy it, we're gonna buy one for ourselves and one for somebody we love that needs to read it. Exactly, I love. And it. Remember, not just for teachers. Yes, not just for teachers. Anybody who cares about our children. I love it. Well, I cannot wait to purchase multiple copies and give them as gifts. And I'm so thankful that you were able to take some time today and talk with me and share your book with me um, because I think it really is going to make a great impact on educators and parents alike. Awesome. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. That was the end. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I want to hear from you. If you hear something that resonates with you, give this show a like and a comment. Feedback fuels growth and I'm ultimately here for you. I can't wait to have you back next week.